What is going on, guys? Welcome back to We One Picks. My name is Jacob, aka the Freckled Salamander, here to bring you my quick pick video for UFC Austin. But before we get into all these picks, make sure you go to WeOnePicks.com. Consider becoming a premium member today. It's only ten dollars a month. Last week, I guess it wasn't last week, but a couple weeks ago, my picks were twelve and two. We hit almost every single bet on the board. Sign up today before the year ends, and let's end 2023. With an absolute bang. I cannot wait for this card. I will be live streaming on Saturday. So make sure you tune into this channel. We had almost a thousand people in here last live stream. We are killing it. We have a ton of fun. So make sure you stop by. Say hello. Make some money. And without further ado. Let's get into the quick pick video. For UFC Austin. First up, we've got Veronica Hardy versus Jamie Lynn Horth. And this is a matchup that should be pretty interesting to get the fight started. Listen, I understand the love affair that people have for Veronica Hardy in this matchup. She came in huge underdog versus Juliana Miller. Made her look absolutely silly in the octagon and kind of dominated that, that fight from bell to bell. But a lot of people are trying to take that fight and applying it to this fight, saying she was a big underdog in that fight. Now she's an underdog again. We got to get that value. We have to put money on Veronica Hardy. I think this is a wait and see. Let's wait and see if Veronica Hardy is still improving. She came in and looked better than she has in the past versus Juliana Miller. But Juliana Miller is just more... That fight proved to us more that Juliana Miller just isn't who we thought she was. More than Veronica Hardy coming in and being this dominant fighter. She, you know, Juliana Miller kind of was like falling backwards on the ground. And Veronica was able to get on top. In the striking, Veronica was still getting struck at times. And Jamie Lynn Horth, Jamie Lynn Horth is going to be pretty big in this match. She's going to have the height. She's going to have the reach. I think she's going to have the striking advantage. And I don't think Veronica Hardy is going to be able to get the takedown. So people think she's going to get. And just going to get pieced up on the feet. So I'm going to go with Jamie Lee Horth in this matchup. I don't absolutely love it. But I think there is value there. She's been at Lobo Gym. You guys know how I love Lobo Gym fighters. So first fight of the night. I am going with Jamie Lim Horth with confidence level. Eh, low to medium, I would say. Let's move on to the next one. Wellington versus Jared. And this one is, to me... This is, as long as Wellington, there's going to be a couple fights like this, as, and it's, it's going to sound stupid, but as long as Wellington can avoid the knockout shot, he should dominate this fight. I mean, his striking has really, really improved. I actually thought he won his last fight versus Randy Brown. I thought he won that first round, came back, and definitely won that third round. I thought he won that fight. I thought his striking looked pretty good. He's going to have the striking advantage versus Jared. Jared's a guy that's came back into the UFC, and when you watch him fight, especially his last fight, He's kind of even regressed as a fighter. He is just hands low, looking for that one-punch knockout power. Maybe he's able to mix in a takedown or two, but I don't think he's going to be able to get the entries there against Wellington. Wellington is basically like a pocket Alex Pajeda in the way that he strikes these days. He's got that same leg kick, the same striking style. Doesn't have the same power. Doesn't have the same techniques, but the same type of style, which is kind of volume, volume, volume. And I think that should be enough to win him this fight. Now, if Jared finds a big shot and knocks out a guy like Wellington, who has been chin in the past, I'm not going to be super surprised, but Wellington is the better fighter here. It seems to me like he's actually getting better as a fighter, now coming down to 170 the last couple fights. So, I'm Wellington here. Medium confidence. Let's move on to the next one. Ehor versus Rodolfo, and this one is like... Whew. I mean, I feel like the odds on this are the most ridiculous odds on the card. I understand that Rodolfo is kind of a tough guy. He's kind of a methodical guy. He'll kind of volume in your face with good pressure. But I think this is going to turn into a 50-50 fight. Ehor gets in your face. He makes fights brawls. He, he starts throwing crazy. He gets hit. will throw even crazier. And in a 50-50 fight, you want a minus 400 favorite that's been chinned before in the past. Not saying that Ehor hasn't been chinned. We've seen him get chinned as well. But a minus 350, minus 400 favorite for a 50-50 in the pocket phone booth fight. And I think Ehor's the faster guy. And typically... This was almost like the uh, Matt Fravola Drew Dober breakdown. And everyone shit on me before. But I said that Matt Fravola was probably going to be the faster guy. And typically, in phone booth fights, when power is equal, and I think these guys have equal power, and chins are equal, and I think these guys have equal chins, it's going to be the speed. Who can get to the shot faster? And I think e is the faster guy. So I'm not super confident in this, but I think that's a value play, especially early, maybe an e first round knockout. My pick is e in this matchup. I think he is a, he, he's a little bit of a dog. I don't think Rodolfo is as good as people think he is. He can get chinned as well. And I think Ehor is the faster striker. That's all it comes down to. I think this fa I think this fight is over quick, fast, and in a hurry. And I think Ehor can beat him to the punch. 
Let's move on to the next one. Eve Garcia and Milk. And this is kind of the same thing, almost as the, I, I would say the Wellington fight, but I'm going to give a little bit more credit to Steve Garcia than Jared Good. Steve Garcia is an absolute dog. He is very, very powerful puncher. He has been chinned, but when he gets chinned, he seems to recover okay. The last time he was chinned, it seemed a little bit more fugacious, a little bit more of like, oh no, is he going to get up from this one? And I'm telling you right now, if he didn't have those chin issues, this guy's a dog. He is a fighter. He is a fighter's fighter. He is everything you want when you're watching a fight. You're like, this is what I want to see. Somebody that's just in your face, throwing hot, throwing heavy, can take a shot, get back up, and still knock somebody out. Steve Garcia is that type of dude. But he does get chin, man. And if he was not getting chin in the way that he has been getting chin, he was going to be my lock of the week. Because I love you guys. No, I absolutely love dogs as my lock of the week. But Milk... He should be the overall better fighter. He should be able to handle the power. He's shown he's got a decent chin as well. I think Tiago dropped him a little bit, but he handled it pretty well. I think Melk's going to be the better fighter in this matchup. I think he's going to fight. He's going to kind of dance around early on, pick his spots, pick his spots, maybe mix in some grappling or two, and Steve Garcia might start fading as the fight goes on. So if Melk can avoid getting in a brawl, because if Steve baits him into a brawl, Again, this turns into like a 50-50 fight, and it's whoever chin holds up is going to win the fight. But if Melky can can stay out of that brawl and not be that shooter box guy for once and just fight very, very smart and methodically, he should be able to win this fight. I think he can do that. But Steve's live, man. If people are playing Steve, I get it. He is a live dog. There is no doubt about that. He's got real power. My pick is Costa. Let's move on to the next one. Joe Selecki versus Drakkar Close. And I'll be honest with you, this is the one I... <laughs> I'm going back and forth on this one, man. This, this is two kind of wrestlers. You got Jakar with power. Joe Selecki, more of the jiu-jitsu than the wrestling. Jakar with the wrestling. Here's what I'll say. If Joe Selecki is able to get the takedowns and get the back control, he's going to win the fight. I mean, that's Captain Obvious here. That's an obvious situation. If you're Jakar close... The thing that I worry about for Jakar Close is he always defaults to the wrestling. Even if he's having success in the striking, he is striking into exchanges and striking into the pressure, getting in somebody's face and maybe even hurting somebody. He will clinch and try to get a takedown. And maybe he's able to get a takedown on Joe Selecki and kind of neutralize the jiu-jitsu and wear him out and just kind of ride him out for a victory. There is a path to victory for him doing that. But I think he's the better striker in this matchup. I think he's got the power advantage. If I'm game planning for a guy like Jakar Close... I, I almost do the same game plan that I said for Diego and Pat Sabatini. Not quite the same thing, but I don't want to wrestle. I'm not, I'm not wrestling and, and, and grappling and letting Joe Selecki maybe find a sweep or something on the ground. I'm just striking with this dude. I'm just getting in his face, nice smart pressure, and just kind of touching him and touching him and look for that power shot. The issue, too, for a guy like Jakar Close is he does get a little bit too aggressive. And against Rafa, Rafa was able to level change underneath the pressure and get really timely takedowns on Jakar Close. And he he watched Joe Selecki in his last fight. He is also really good. He's kind of a jiu-jitsu nerd, but he's really good at timing those single and double leg entries off of pressure. You come with a big shot, it's a level change on your legs, and you're on your back. So that's what worries me for Jakar. But when it comes down to two close fights and two close guys, I got to take the guy that I believe has the striking advantage and a little bit of the wrestling advantage versus the grappling. Joe Selecki could be playing the guard game a little bit too much if Jakar gets uh, uh, on top. So I'm going Jakar close here, but this is like I've gone back and forth. I actually don't have any money on Jakar, but I do have a little bit of a sprinkle on Joe Selecki. So you can go to WeWantPicks.com, become a premium member today to see what that is. But let's move on to the next one. Odie Brundage versus Zach Reese. And I'm telling you right now, you... I, I, I had this argument with Angelo. I've been having this argument with Angelo all week. I'm telling you right now, this dude, Zach Reese, if you guys want to listen to me, if you don't want to listen to me, I will say this. You don't have to listen to me. Just go watch his contender series fight. Just go watch his contender series fight and ask yourself, do I want to lay minus 200, minus 250 money on that guy? On that guy, this guy stands straight up in the air. He's a tall guy, 6'3". Just because you're 6'3", a lot of times, that chin is right there on that level. And this dude stands straight up. There is no head movement. There is no side to side. It is straight up. It is stiff. It is chin in the air, and he can get taken down as well. And what does Cody do? If he does nothing else, he's a great actor, right? We saw that in the last fight. I'm not a Cody lover, 
right? I got burned as well. We were on the live stream. We were all hating on. I get the hate for Cody Brundage, but in an MMA fight, you got to put all that aside. What does Cody do? He's got a nice, powerful right hand right down the pipe that hurts people. And when you got a tall guy that doesn't move his head with zero footwork and he just goes straight back to defend shots, those overhand rights are very easy to get. And also, Cody can get takedowns too. I'm telling you right now, if there is a red flag of red flags on this card, I understand the hate that people have for Cody Brundage. And Cody Brundage could probably come in and act like an idiot and lose this fight. There's no doubt about that. But I'm telling you, to trust a guy like Zach Reese in parlays and money lines, let's just wait and see. There's no reason you need to bet. I understand that people hate Cody Brundage. He's still a formidable fighter. He's still a guy that has UFC wins. He is a guy that almost beat Hadolfo. I mean, he, he's he been in there and seen, and we've seen that he can be an active guy for Zach Reese. This guy, the last guy he he knocked out was 4-12. and 12. His knockouts before that were versus 0-0, 0-1 and 0, 0 and like fat heavyweights. Let's wait and see before we bet on this guy, guys. I'm putting a little bit of a sprinkle on Cody Brundage. You can see what that is on the website, but my pick, I'm going Cody Brundage here. I think he finds that right hand. This guy is tall. It's straight up in the air with that chin hanging. I hate the way that this dude, Zachary, strikes, and I think Cody finds him in an upset Let's move on to the next one. Shove versus Julia. And this is a, this is another one where it's like, you know, if you're betting this fight, I don't know why you'd bet this fight, but Misha in her last fight was kind of given an opportunity to bounce back from that Ketlin loss against her girl like Lauren Murphy, 40 years old as well. And Misha did not look good. I mean, that was from the opening bell. It was like, oh, no, Misha is absolutely slow. Couldn't get the takedowns. Striking looked slow. It started to look a little bit better as the fight went on. She definitely is tough. But that striking was so slow against a girl like Julia, who typically, when she is fighting, she is blitzing forward, getting his girl's faces, throwing nine, seven, eight, nine, ten punch combinations, really kind of messing them up, is able to defend the takedowns. The good news for Misha is... In between those blitzes from Julia, she really doesn't, she kind of takes off about 30 seconds, right? She's blitzing in, she's backing up, and then she's kind of just waiting, waiting, waiting. If Misha's able to do enough in the striking, in between those blitzes, she definitely can win this decision because I think that both, the, both these girls are tough girls. I don't see a, a finish unless something weird happens in this matchup. So if Misha's able to do enough in between those big blitzes from Julia, maybe mix in a takedown to her, even hold her against the cage, because you can't hold a girl like Julia against the cage. Misha, let's slow this down. Let's use your physicality. Let's use your veteran savvy. Slow this fight down, get her against the cage, win rounds that way. But if this is just open, striking, kickboxing, I think Misha gets touched up, and I think she loses this fight. So I am going Julia in this matchup. Let's move on to the next one. Buna Healy versus Dustin Stolzfus. Dustin is a former Locker of the Week, one of the greatest Locker of the Weeks of all time. Why, you ask? Because this dude is 1-4 and four in the UFC. Probably doesn't belong in the UFC, but his one win was as Lock of the... Was as... Was lock of the week as his one. I don't know if that makes sense. His one win was when he was lock of the week. And even in that fight, he should have dominated that fight. He should have used his wrestling in that fight. Didn't use it until the very end to solidify the third round to win that. I was like, what is this guy doing? He does not do what he needs to do, which is wrestling. He is a wrestler. He is a grappler. He cannot strike. He has no chin at all. And in this matchup, even if he wants to wrestle, even if he wants to use the grappling, he isn't like an overly dominant wrestler, doesn't have overly great takedowns, and against a wrestling type like Puna Healy, Puna Healy should be able to defend those takedowns. This is a situation where, you know, Puna Healy is not the greatest dude in the world, but he's more than capable of beating a guy like Dustin. Puna Healy should come in and smoke this guy, honestly. Just, I mean, wait for those big shots. The big shots will be there if he, if he comes in and actually has a game plan for once. Just defend the takedowns, and Dustin should have nothing left for you. I am going Puna Healy in this matchup, and I'm pretty confident in it. Let's move on to the next one. Play Guida versus Joaquin Silva. And Joaquin Silva looks the part, man. I mean, that dude, I mean, if if I if I had to copy and paste a body and put it on myself of every one of the UFC, it might be Joaquin Silva. That dude is jacked. Looks fantastic. Looks the part. If you saw him and asked Everyone on the street, what do you think this guy's record is in MMA? They'd probably be like, oh, he's probably undefeated. He just looks that part. And for good reason. He's got good power, got jujitsu, got good jujitsu. 
But Clay Guida's a dog, man. And Clay Guida also has a special place in my heart. Lock of the week. He was the very first lock of the week winner of all time. Like three years ago, before we even started tracking the thing. When I first made up this $100 lock of the week. Clay, Clay Guida was the very first person to win as lock of the week. And honestly, this is going to be kind of 50-50 bias, 50-50 breakdown. I'm, I'm going Clay. I'm going Clay Guida here. I, I I like him in this matchup. Listen, Clay Guida is not a guy that really gets chin. He gets hit, but you never really see him get laid out. So if you take out the knockout ability from Joaquin Silva and you take that away from him, now all he has is jujitsu. If Clay Guida doesn't fall into some random guillotine or something like that, which could happen, right? We've seen Clay Guida get, get subbed in the past in a, a variety of ways, and Silva is a high-level dude. But if Clay Guida just does Clay Guida, and that's get in the pocket, throw heavy hands, keep that constant pressure, bouncing in and out, he can wear this guy down. Not only can he wear this guy down, I think he can wear him down to a point where he could finish Joaquin Silva in the second or the third round. Joaquin Silva's going to be live in the first round, and he's going to have power. And he can knock out a guy like Clay, like Clay Guida, even though Guida isn't really like a chinny dude. But... Guida gets in the pocket, avoids the power, lands some shot, does what he does. I think he comes in and upsets. I, I, this one of the, I feel like this is one of the more disrespectful lines on the car because Clay Guida is not easy out. Joaquin Silva, it's not like he's just eliminating everyone in his path. He has been chinned before as well. We might see a little Clay Guida knockout is what I'm saying in this matchup. I'm going Clay Guida here, but again, this is like 50% bias. So don't listen to me, but 50% actual breakdowns. I think that he can get in, survive early, and really break down a guy like Joaquin Silva. All those muscles, they really kind of hinder you late in fights, late in the bedroom. On Brady versus Kelvin Gaslam. Kelvin Gaslam, absolute lock of the week. If you haven't watched the lock of the week video, I posted it on Monday. Please go watch that video, like that video. It's a great one. I put a nice little skit together for it. A great highlight video for Kelvin Gaslam. I mean, he's the better fighter. He, I mean, he is the better fighter. There, I don't think there's any question he's a better fighter. He's a better striker. He can wrestle as well. He's got a good gas tank. He's got a good chin. Sean Brady, the first time that he saw anyone of the upper echelon level of the UFC, he folded like a lawn chair against Bilal Muhammad. He got outstruck and finished by a boring wrestler. Now he's up against a dynamic boxing striker with Mexican toughness and 185 power coming down to 170. This dude, Sean Brady's in trouble. And I sat here, and if you watch our videos, and I've said it all week, I said that Sean Brady was going to smoke below Muhammad. I was a below Muhammad hater. I, I, I was, uh, Sean Brady was my dude. Pat Sabatini and Sean Brady used to be my dudes. They've made zero improvements in the striking. They are absolutely delusional in their skills and abilities. They both think that they can strike with anyone. You even saw Andre Petrosi coming on short notice versus Michelle Bejeda. And he thought, oh, I'm just going to knock out Michelle Bejeda because I'm such a good striker. And got fucking flatlined. Pat Sabatini was like, I'm going to show I'm an overall fighter versus, versus Diego Lopez. Got fucking smoked. Sean Brady said, I beat Bilal Muhammad 9 out of 10 times. No, you don't. You got smoked. He's going to come in, try to strike with Kelvin, get touched up, get bloody, break that nose again, try to shoot takedowns. They're not going to work, and he's going to get finished. Move on to the next one. A five versus Figgy, and this one, I I, I was going to make Figgy my lock of the week, man. I, I really was going to make Figgy my lock of the week. Then I started thinking about it a little bit more. If this is standing... This, this fight's very easy to break down in my mind. It's going to go one of two ways. It's either going to be standing for 15 minutes and Ralph Font's going to win because he's a better fight. He's a, he's a better boxer. He's, he's got the range. Figgy will start to slow down, right? Figgy's, I mean, he's got that one punch power and he's got decent striking. It's not like, I mean, the guy was a champion of the world. It's not like he's a nobody in the striking department. But at 135 against a slick boxer like Rob Font, I don't think he's going to be able to find that power and he's going to get worked with the with the jab and the boxing Rob Font. If it stays standing, I I think Rob Font's going to win this fight. Davison has to get this fight to the ground. He's got to shoot takedowns. He's got to get scrambles going. He's got to use his jujitsu. He is the better wrestler and grappler in this matchup. So I think the way to play this is easy. I'm going Figgy because I got to hope working with Cejudo. They have a game plan. They understand you can't really, nobody can really box 
with raw font unless you have like crazy range and power on top of it and figgy only has kind of one of those things and the power kind of takes a dive after the first round so i have to assume that they're going to bring in some wrestling bring in some grappling so he is going to be my pick if this goes 15 minutes of just boxing he's probably going to lose so i think the way to play this is figgy inside the distance decisional action if it goes to a decision it feels like it's probably going to be like a 75 percent chance that raw font wins this because that means it's probably standing but if Figgy wins, that means he's probably working in takedowns, probably working in the jiu-jitsu. Maybe he does find that big overhand right or something wild in the pocket, but it's going to be the grappling. It's going to be a submission bet. And if it goes to a decision and Rob Font just outboxes him for 15 minutes, you get your money back. But if Figgy comes in, gets it to the ground, gets submission, you're going to win that bet. I think that's the way to play it. I've played it two different ways. We want picks.com. Become a premium member to see how I played it. But I'm taking Figgy in this matchup. I'm going to be worried. I'm going to be worried if he stands and boxes with Rob Font for 15 minutes. Let's move on to the next one. Jalen Turner versus Bobby Green. I love both these guys, man. I, I love both these guys. The Tarantula, Jalen Turner, Bobby King Green. I've been a Bobby Green fan for a long time. And I know most people think, oh, man, Bobby had a, a winnable fight. Drop. Jalen Turner's coming in. And he's going to smoke him. Everyone, uh, Jalen Turner's coming in. He's going to smoke Bobby. And that's the end of Bobby King Green. I'm telling you right now, I might even flip my pick. I'm going Jalen Turner here because obviously he, he is probably the better fighter. He's got the striking. He's got grappling as well. But this short notice, 155, I have no idea how Jalen Turner's making this way. I have no idea how Jalen Turner's making this way. Even if he does make this weight, we've seen Jalen Turner in fights start to fade after the first round. Now, he's not a quitter, and he will do some other things in the second and the third round. He will still be there. He will start hanging around. But in a style of fight against Bobby Green with his long striking, those long strikes, while powerful and dynamic in the first round, are long rangy and slow in the second and third and the way that Bobby is able to fill his shell and counter off those striking I'm saying this right now if Jalen Turner does not hurt Bobby Green bad in the first round or put him out in the first round either with submission you know Jalen's a long dude weird stuff happens or knock him out if he does not put Bobby Green out in the first round I am gonna sit here on Saturday live stream and I'm probably gonna live bet the fucking shit out of Bobby Green because I think this fight turns very, very fast in the second and the third rounds with Bobby's style of counter-striking and boxing. I think that the the style of his defense and the way that he can counter and put pressure on people will, 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 really, will really wear down a guy like Jalen Turner on short notice. If this was full camp, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Again, my pick is Jalen because I think he can get something done in the first round. But man, oh man. People, people are acting like Bobby has no chance in this fight. This gets out of the first round. I would favor Bobby Green to win the second and win the third rounds and maybe even try to find a finish in the third round against Jalen Turner with his style of boxing, the way that he's able to counter strike. So, and don't forget too, and I'm telling you, this will, this, I mean, this would never happen. I mentioned it last night. If I was game planning for Bobby Green, and this will never happen, but if I was game planning for Bobby Green and I was in his corner and, and I said, listen, Bobby, if you want to win this fight, you want to win this fight and maybe get a, a title shot two fights from now because you're right there and you're a name, what Bobby Green needs to do in this fight, short notice against a guy that could have cardio issues, Bobby's a good wrestler. I would come in and I would wrestle the entire first round. If I was Bobby Green, I would get on Jalen's hips. I would try to wrestle this guy for five minutes and just blow his lungs out and then go to the box. It's never going to happen, right? Because Bobby, Bobby is who he is, right? He's going to get in your face, fill his shell, try to counter strike. But if I was game plan, if Bobby wanted to listen... I would try to blow the lungs out of Jalen Turner the first round with wrestling, make him defend all those shots, then start counter-striking. You could even win a 30-27 decision because of that. But I'm going Jalen Turner here, but I am not as, as high and as heavy as everyone else on Jalen. People think he's going to smoke Bobby. After the first round, if Bobby doesn't take a lot of damage, let's start looking for live bets. Tune in for the live stream Saturday. I'll be right here live betting the shit out of Bobby Green. My official pick is Jalen. We might flip that. Stay tuned. Main event time. Benil Darius versus Armin Sarukian. And I, this is another one of those situations. I'm picking Armin in this fight. I'm not betting Armin, right? I'm, I'm, let me just put this out there too. I'm a, I'm an Armin hater, but I'm also kind of a Darius hater as well. So my biases kind of cancel each other out. So honestly, I can look at this fight in a way 
where I feel like it's pretty fair to both parties. Here's how I would game plan. Again, this is one of those situations where it's like, I can, I can mythically try to game plan for these fighters, but I can't fight these fights for them. If I'm Armin, kickbox. You just got to kickbox this guy. Avoid the power, keep range, use your kicks mostly, and let's kickbox this guy. Let's point fight this guy. Let's wear him down. Then if you want to try and start mixing in takedowns around three, four, five, whatever it is, let's wear him down first. Because if you come in, as a young kid and think that you're going to try to prove a point by out grappling and out wrestling a guy like Darius, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And you're going to look like Gamrot in there. Gamrot had some success and he might have like somehow maybe won that fight because he looked like he was doing a little bit more. That's besides the point. But you're probably going to lose a decision when, when Darius is just defending all these takedowns. You can't wrestle this guy. You can't come in thinking I'm going to get all these takedowns on this guy. Just point fight him. Just kickbox him. Try to wrestle late. And that's the way. Because I think Armin is the better striker, the faster striker. He's not going to have the power. But it's the, I think he's the better dynamic striker of the two. If I'm Darius... Again, this is like the Bobby Green situation. This is like, you've never really seen this at a Darius, so it's probably not going to happen. But if I'm game planning for Darius, I initiate the wrestling. I initiate those scrambles because Darius is the better grappler. He's not the better wrestler, but he's a better grappler. And he's so good in defending and using those scrambles. The issue is... When he was scrambling against Gamrot, he was scrambling to get back to his feet. And for good reason, because he probably was a little bit better striker than Gamrot. In this situation, if I'm Darius, I'm initiating the wrestling to force scrambles and using my scrambling and jiu-jitsu to use offensive jiu-jitsu, get on this guy's back and try to find a submission. That's how I would play it if I'm, if I'm Darius. But Darius is probably going to do what he does. Wait for the takedowns, defend the takedowns, and try to land big power shots that I don't think he's going to land on a guy like Armin. Armin should be faster, better footwork. I know that he has been chinned. Darius has been chinned as well. If, if Darius comes in and, and smokes the kid, finds the chin, it is what it is. But I think that Armin is the better fighter. The young kid, he should have a good game plan, but he could mess this up, man. He could mess this up, and that's why I think the odds have gotten a little bit away from betting a guy like Armin, especially against a guy as dangerous as Darius. So, so, officially, main event, UFC Austin pick. My pick is going to be Armin Sarukian, but I'm not betting it quite yet. We'll see how the odds play out. If he was like a minus, minus 175, minus 200, it's, I, it's, I think that's playable. But anything over minus 200, I think it's just like, let's just maybe play props, something like that. But that is going to be my pick. And this has been my quick pick video for UFC Austin. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure you like the video before you go. Subscribe if you are new. We are almost at 20,000 subscribers on the channel. So subscribe if you are new. We want picks.com, $10 a month. Check it out. My name's Jacob, aka the Freckled Salamander. I'm out. Peace.